Throughout history, we have progressed through different epochs, each based on a different economy. We are now in the age of wonderment. That's our epoch. And the basis by which we compete and contribute to this economy is based on our individual ability to create. Never before in life, in history, have individuals had a power to contribute, because now we own the means of production. We own our brain, and therefore we own the ability to create and contribute. Some, however, are more successful because they're more creative. As we think about our youth and age of wonderment, let's keep in mind these qualities that we should cultivate in them, with special emphasis on those in red. Creativity, playfulness, passion, and purpose. First, creativity. IBM says it is the number one quality they seek in future leaders, and that's buttressed by a variety of other institutions, such as this, this, and this. 2009, CBS did a survey asking people, do you think that we are more creative today than 40 years ago? The vast majority of people said we're more creative today, especially the young. However, Dr. Kim, in the year 2010, found just the opposite. And analyzing the results of the TTCT, the Torrance Test of Creative Thinking, she found that our scores have fallen some precipitously. So creativity is critical. We think we're creative, but we're not. More than ever, we need our people, our young people, to be creative. But we are playing. Who wants to be a teenage zombie? Shall we play that now? Those of you in the audience who are high school students, answer this question. What's the best reason to take AP class? Is it A? extra weighting on GPA, B, because you love the subject, or C, it looks great on your transcript, or D, because you want to challenge yourself. So, shout them out, high school teenagers. What's your answer? All over the map here. If you chose B, enjoy the subject, or D, challenge yourself, sorry, you're wrong. It's A or C. Second question, what's the best reason for taking or participating in a service club? Is it A, because you have to, to graduate. Or is it B, because you love to serve other people? Or is it C, because it looks great on your transcript? Or is it D, because you want to grow your leadership skills? Shout them out, high school teenagers. Sorry, it's once again A or C. Last question, last chance. What's your passion? Uh, A, don't know. B, uh, haven't thought about that. C, 2400. Or D, rank number one valedictorian. So how many of you here got all three correct? A few. Congratulations. You are now an authentic, genuine teenage zombie with all the benefits of being such. You see, you will be well-fed. You'll be fed three times a day. You will be force-fed. You'll be told what to think, what to do, and what to feel. Your life will be simple. Does it sound great to you? No. It's, it's, it's very, very bad. You see, as a society, we must all fight this incipient epidemic of teenage zombieism. How? Start with what we know best and with which we have most control, our own families. Start with creating a zombie-free zone in the families. Now I'm speaking to both the youth and your parents. Every week, make it a point, about 60 minutes minimum, every week, give your teenagers the chance to play. Leave them alone. Teenagers, Put thoughts of SAT, ACT, GPA, AP exam away. Just play. See, we should be playing, not playing who wants to be a teenage zombie. How do we play? Invite someone you know to play. That person is your inner child. We all have that child. Invite the person to come out and play. How? One simple guide. Whatever you play, you must find the object of play completely captivating and endlessly Enchanting. The same attitude that this boy feels toward this black furry object that moves in and out of his field of vision. This is Javier, whom you heard speak about two hours ago. Javier with our Manx cat, a cat with no tail. You see how he's completely immersed in this black furry thing. He's oblivious to the fact that he's drooling, going, oh, uh, uh, uh. He is completely selfless because he's so enchanted by this black very thing that's just out of reach but close enough to be tantalizing. That's the same spirit we're asking you, the youth, to play. When you play, stay real. That means screen technologies, move them aside. 
No smartphones, no iPads, no iPods. Why? As great as they are, they are an intermediary. They are a barrier between you and the real world. You must be tangible and engage with the real world. You'll get them back after the hour, but for that one hour, put all screen technologies aside and play with that which is real. And when you play with that which is real, record what you do in a journal. Put down what you do in that hour every week, what you felt, what did you enjoy, what did you not enjoy, what surprises did you find. And from that journal, you'll begin to detect patterns. What gives you pleasure? What is it that you find completely captivating that you want to do over and over again, that you can't wait till next Sunday or Saturday to do over again? And from these patterns you detect, you begin to detect what gives you your passion, that which you find extremely attractive that you cannot live without. And then comes the pivot. Apply your passion to serve other people. So turn outward. Whatever that passion might be, whether it's training beluga whales, restoring old guitars, playing soccer, it doesn't really matter. It's whatever you find to give you passion. Apply it to serve other people because it is in the serving of other people that we evoke our best self. The same child you ask to come out and play, the same child that's also generous, kind, and compassionate, not just curious. So evoke from yourself the inner child, and that child will lead you to discover your purpose. What is your purpose? It's tragic that most young people I talk to have no clue about what is their purpose. They don't know what the reason is for their existence. They don't know what they're about to achieve with their limited time on earth. I ask them to think, what will the world mourn when you leave this earth? What will you be no longer be able to provide this world that only you provided and only you can provide? Think about that that you will leave indelibly in the minds of many, many people on the earth. If you can't answer that yet, go back to your zombie-free zone, play, stay real, keep a journal, find your passion, turn it outward, serve other people who are in great need in a social venture project, for example, and then you begin to find your purpose. Play now, don't put it off, because if you put it off, you will pay later. You see, what happens is, if you habitually procrastinate in playing, you will tolerate lack of play. And over time, you will miss play less and less. And one day, when you're 48 years old, you'll wake up when it's still dark, 5 a.m., and you will feel this quiet sadness. You will realize that the life you have been living was not meant for you, that you were meant for bigger and better things. And you feel sad that maybe you've already been too late in recognizing that. But then you begin to see a ray of hope because you have then a distant memory of when you were a child. And remember playing with something, it could be anything, but that something was completely captivating, was endlessly enchanting. And then you begin to have a ray of hope that maybe it's not too late, that maybe you can go back and recapture that sense of wonder, sense of wonderment. But then comes another dark thought, which is you're 48 years old, you have a mortgage to pay, Three kids in college with high tuition fees. You have aging parents who need your time, your attention, or financial support. And you, re you realize at that moment, you cannot afford to wake up and play. You must go back to being a zombie because at that point in time, you are stuck. And as, as sad as it is to be a zombie, it's even more tragic to be a zombie who begins to wake up and realize you cannot afford to wake up anymore. And that you must retract and pretend you, you never had a glimpse of hope. That is truly tragic. In my 20 plus years of working in corporate America, I've seen many people go through that very experience and resign themselves, swallow, swallow their wonderment and resign themselves to lifelong zombie on Medicare. I'm speaking from experience. I was a zombie, I'm recovering from one, so I speak to you from having been there. Play is essential to life. Carl Jung said, the creation of something new is not created, achieved by the intellect, achieved by the play instinct deep inside all of us. It's essential, you see, it's necessity, it's not frivolous, it's not luxury, it's essential for us to realize our humanity, it is done through play. So play is serious work. Take it very, very seriously. It's as essential as breathing and drinking water. 
what we've been describing so far is purposeful. Having our young people have a zone of zombie freeness every week, let them play with complete captive, captivation, endless enchantment, and have them stay real, keep a journal so they can detect patterns but what gives them passion, and turn that passion outward through a social mentor project that serve other people, evokes their noblest self, and that gives them purpose. My number one goal as a parent is to help my two boys, Javier and Fabian, discern their purpose in life, and then help them cultivate the skills, the knowledge, the character traits, and capabilities to achieve that purpose. Of course, I should show love, kindness, lovingness. Yeah, 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 of course, of course. But my number one goal is help them find their purpose and achieve that purpose by cultivating those skills. This is very purposeful, very noble, but there's more. Because if you do this with earnestness, you'll find a very attractive small side benefit. You see, it goes like this. For many of you out in the audience, you are a very high-achieving college material. Your high school seniors, juniors, with high GPAs, SAT scores, ACT scores. You're probably a part of five clubs, of which you are officers of three of them. You probably play soccer, you play tennis, you play piano and violin. You also volunteer once a week at a hospital or nursing home. You look great on paper, but you see from the eyes of an admissions officer between November and March every year, you are one of a sea of zombies. They can't tell you apart because there's so many people who look just like you on paper. So, by doing this purposeful, playfully created project to serve a community that you apply your talent toward, you will become distinctive. You will stand out. But remember, this is simply a nice side benefit. Purposeful is still the main reason you should do what we ask you to do. Now, one last consideration. Sometimes people say, oh, but I don't know where to begin. We're not particularly creative. I don't know what kinds of things we can do as a family. I'm stuck with constraints. Well, think of yourself as an artist. All artists face constraints. Matter of fact, it's the artist's constraints that evokes that creative potential. So see your life as a piece of artwork and see your constraints as that which will provide the nexus, the focus, to events to evoke that creativity in you. So whether you are a poet and you face the lines of 14 lines per sonnet constraint, or whether you are a chess player, you have 64 squares on a chessboard with, with, with winch to show your brilliance, or whether you're a pianist, you deal with 88 keys, or whether you are a typical human being and have only 88 years to your life. There are practically infinite possibilities for you to live the life filled with playful creativity as an artist and not as a zombie. Thank you. <laughs>